Uh-oh. Hey, everybody. This is Diane. Hello, and welcome to Biters. And this is Marnell. And yes, I am flirting with you. And yes, let me just baby bird some wisdom into that pretty little mouth of yours. Ew! <laughs> yes! <laughs> regurgitated bird wisdom (laughs) oh we're back it feels so good god so as you can probably tell we are belatedly podcasting the season 10 premiere of the walking dead the lines we cross and it was so good so good yeah i think we're both really happy with it Yeah, and, like, I don't think it's just because we're coming on such a downhill slide from fear. I I think the show was genuinely good. Amazing. I think some of it is because fear was so incredibly bad, but this was a really phenomenal premiere. I mean, I I felt like they nailed it. Yeah, and, you know, we talked before the show, uh, we had talked on Fear the Walking Dead uh, that Chris Hardwick... You know, he's he can never say anything bad. You know, he has to, you know, be there for the studio and, and AMC and everything. But I it, like it. This uh, Talking Dead felt a little different. I think he was genuinely excited about the show. Yeah. Well, and plus he had Angela Kang and Greg Nicotero on the couch. So, you know, that's, that's always true. good. Yeah. So, I will go first with the rating of the other real Alaskan housewife. God, my mic feels funny all of a sudden. There we go. I was getting some feedback from it that was weird. Um, So, she says, 4.5 zombie scalps. No more Mr. Nice Guy. (laughs) She rated it pretty high. She did. She enjoyed it, too. All right. So, what was your rating? My rating was really difficult to not give it a five. As, as was mine. I gave it a 4.9 hot dog trophies. Oh my god. I gave it 4.87 trophies shaped like dancing hot dogs. <laughs> that was just so great. The one-liners in this episode just... I'm, I'm there for it. Yeah. No, I... This was... It was hard not to rate it a five. It was hard to yeah. find anything bad. Uh, right. I I have a minor, couple minor bads, like a weird bad. Yeah. Which we'll talk about. We'll talk about. So the ratings for, or the numbers rather, for the premiere, Walking Dead and Monday Night Football were tops for cable 25 for the week. Surprisingly, Walking Dead was only third in the 18 to 49 group, and it was only fourth overall. Okay, but are they including the people who are watching it on AMC online? I don't think so. No. No, I, and, it, you know, we've talked about that. We don't, yeah. we don't have to beat that into the ground again that people are watching things differently. Right. I right. just, and, you know, with, with only a rating of 4 million, though... I feel like a lot of people missed out. See, and I don't because I think a lot of people watched it online and probably that you can watch it early online um, and you get like special content and stuff, which drives me insane because I can't get AMC online because of my cable provider. Oh, right. Because it's not in your, your area. Yeah. Yep. Thanks GCI. I could, but again, not going to pay more. Done yeah. paying for more. <laughs> I know. That's one of the things that's actually keeping me from watching Creep Show. Right, me too, like, because I don't want to have to subscribe. Oh, to another thing. And quite frankly, I'm too lazy to unsubscribe if I subscribe. Right? So <laughs> <laughs> I just looked at one of my credit card bills and I was like, huh, Netflix went up. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I pay a weird amount. It's like twelve sixty four or something crazy. That's really weird. I'm paying like 20 something. I need to reevaluate my Netflix membership. (laughs) (laughs) Right. All right. So those were the numbers, you know, overall 1.4 in the 18 to 49 group, 4 million in the, the overall views for the same day. I feel like people are missing out. I hope you're right. I hope they're getting it in other ways and they're not really missing out. 
Right. And then also it's really hard to complete compete with any sports ball. And I, I don't say sports ball facetiously. I do mean like any live sporting event because you, of course you're going to watch that and record The Walking Dead and watch that later, right? Well, not me, but... Not me, no. <laughs> Okay, I'm not going to belabor the writer and the director. Writer was Angela Kang. Director was Greg Nicotero. We both said that we do want to watch Creepshow. Yes. Um, I did check to see if you can get it on iTunes, and it does not look like you can. Probably, like, mid-season or after the season is over. Eventually. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Except maybe they're, it's just going to be an exclusive property to whatever streaming platform it's on. I cannot remember. Okay, Shudder. I did notice that Adrienne Barbeau is in two episodes, which she was in the original Creep Show. So I thought that was very cool that she was making a return. I'm sure that was Greg Nicotero's idea. I love horror and sci-fi and, and all that kind of stuff because they love to do that kind of stuff. They love to get meta. Yeah. Yeah, it would be fun to see her again. Yeah. Dang it. All right. So our featured cast was Juan Javier Cardenas. I'm sure I slaughtered that. A.K.A. <laughs> Dante. Yes. So, yeah, Dante from the books. We're finally getting him. I've got to tell you, he seems a bit like a douchey dude bro. Yeah, I kind of felt that way, too. And he's supposed to have a very unique personality in the books. I haven't gotten that far. But I, I'm i like, mm, I don't know. I don't I know. I just kind of is- remember that he liked antagonizing Maggie and they ultimately ended up together. Yeah, but like, I don't know. And like, you know, kind of the pulling yeah. your braids kind of thing. Yeah, but this whole we're gods thing, I was like, mm, no. Yeah, I agree. And, you yeah. know, working in healthcare, dealing with people who have that attitude about themselves, nah, no, you're not. Oi. Yeah. No. <laughs> so, Juan, uh, he is actually best known for um, the TV show Snowfall. Uh, he was in 11 episodes, and it has been on the list. I just have never gotten there. So that was the only interview that I watched. Did you watch it? I didn't, no. It wasn't very long. It was like two and a half minutes long, and he and one of the other main cast members from Snowfall talked about their roles, and it was really interesting sounding. It's about the crack em- epidemic in L.A. in the 80s. Yeah. And he it- actually plays a Sandinista who is part of trying to get the CIA to import crack to support their covert war in Nicaragua. Oh, see, I like that's why it's it's been on the list. Ever since I saw the first advertisement for it and I just have never it's never gotten up there, but now it definitely might because yeah, it's it's such an interesting subject matter and of course we need to see more of Dante. One well, year. And I will say to his credit, he came off as very bright and very articulate while he was giving his interview. Of course. So I don't think he is anything like his character right. in real life. <laughs> he only has an Instagram. I couldn't find Facebook or Twitter or anything. Um, uh, so you can actually follow him on Twitter. I'm sorry, on Instagram as Juan Javier Cardenas. Um, and he is super funny. He has an amazing vinyl collection. Oh, wow. Yeah. So he actually, he posts pictures a lot of times of the, like a close up of the vinyl that he's listening to. Um, he's an avid reader. It seems like, uh, he is a DIY homeowner. He, uh, has some funny pictures of some work he's done to his house uh, he has a wife of six years and two little girls, and he just, he seems like a really super fun guy. Um, and if you go way, way back in his Instagram, he is actually a very talented uh, drawing artist, uh, pen and paper and um, pencil and paper. So, um, 
there's really not much out there about him. Uh, so on his IMDb, it uh, says that he is a blue belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And he plays guitar, bass, and another kind of bass. I don't know the difference. Hmm. Uh, but he was in an episode of Law & Order. Yes, it was his very first credit, Law & Order SVU in 2010. Yep, and he's been in an NCIS. Mm -hmm. He is a voice in Red Dead Redemption, the video game. Which I heard uh, was really good. Yeah, it's it's got a huge fan base. Um, I, I'm not that big of a gamer. I do, you know, uh, Walking Dead Our World is really the only game that I play. Um, but he was in an episode of The Good Wife, which I love. And he is in four episodes of SWAT, and I kind of do remember him in SWAT. It sounds like he got some critical recognition for that role. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember him in Lethal Weapon, the TV show, but he was in that. Um, and the TV series Shooter, which I didn't watch. Um, he was also in an episode of Criminal Minds. So he's been on all of the um, police shows, basically. <laughs> and I love that he played, quote unquote, fake detective on Blue Bloods. Well, there you go. He was even a fake detective. Fake Not, detective. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so playing so. a fake doctor is a stretch for him. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so there's really not much out there about him yet. But of course, now being cast as Dante, um, I think we're probably going to see a lot more of him. Uh, I, I'm sure he'll be sticking around for a while, given his character in the comic books. But we're so off book at this point. Who knows? I hope they develop him more. I hope they make him more fleshed out. I hope they don't yeah. just keep him as the irritating dude, bro. Right? <laughs> exactly. So did you have anything you'd like to add about Juan Javier? No, that's about it. Like I said, I watched that that little clip that was just a few minutes of he and his co-star from Snowfall talking. Sounded good. So I uh, encourage everyone to follow him on Instagram because he's, he's pretty funny. So <sighs> that's all I got. Well, Whisperer's Corner was not busy but there was some pretty meaty stuff in Whis whisperer's corner mm -hmm. um before i get to that i want to say to people that if you are interested in politics and you don't have to be a lefty like me and marnell um there's a very good interview this week on stay tuned with preet do you ever listen to that no i don't so preet Bar barara barara the yep was an attorney for the Southern District of New York, a federal attorney, and he ended up losing his job at the beginning of the Trump era and has since gone on to do this kind of sociopolitical podcast that's very interesting. And this week he interviews George Conway, who is the husband of Kellyanne Conway. And it's very interesting because even though Kellyanne is highly placed in the Trump administration, George Conway has been a pretty vocal critic of, the, of Donald Trump. Right. But he also is a staunch conservative, so it's a very interesting interview. Hmm. So, you know, if somebody wants something different, something that's not Walking Dead related, if you're kind of interested in politics, I would recommend listening to this interview. It's been quite good. Interesting. I'm actually listening to, um, I think it's called There's Something About Pam or The Thing About Pam. Hmm. And it's, um, uh, it's kind of, it's, the guy who does Dateline. Um, oh, okay. And, Keith yeah, so it's something. Yeah, so it's a true crime podcast. Uh, and so far, uh, episode one is pretty interesting. Uh, it's the one that this one's about um, a guy who is accused of order, murdering his wife. And his wife is not Pam. So I wonder who the person who really murdered his wife is. Hmm. Could it be Pam? I don't know, but you may have to shoot me the name of that in a message so I can listen to it. Well, when somebody first told me about it, I swear they said the thing about ham. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. So I still need to catch up on Prodigal Son. This has been such a busy week. I am telling you, being unemployed 
makes you really busy. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a job interview this week. I took an advanced cardiac life support class this week. I get invited to return to the ER, which I'm not going to do. And I got offered a job, which I am going to do. Yay! Yeah. So I am gainfully unemployed no longer. <laughs> that was a very short un unemployment. Thank God. Right. And thank you to everyone on Biters who has been so supportive. I really appreciate it. Yeah. You've had a rough week. Rough couple of weeks. Rough five weeks, man. I was thinking about it yesterday. And in five weeks, I've had hip surgery. Oh, lost my right. horses. Lost my goats. Lost a dog. Lost my job. <laughs> It's like, oh, okay, I, my, I would like to not have whiplash this coming week. That would be good. No, no, yeah. Well, so Whisperer's Corner. So the first thing, um, Thomas O'Mara approached me about this. He actually got contacted by Emma Bell, who is the girl who played Amy. Oh, that's right. And she is trying to get her movie called Nice Trick crowdsourced, crowdfunded. Oh, so if you go to nice trick, the com, you can look at a description of the movie. You can look at the different levels of buy in that you can make on the movie and what kind of rewards you get for the movie. And they range from things like a shout out on social media to being in the movie to having dinner with Emma Bell. You can get all sorts of different levels depending on what you're willing to commit to the project. Interesting. Very cool. She says in her description that she wants to make it a point to cast women and minorities. Are you looking, a, you're looking it up? I am looking it up. Um, so I really encourage people to go ahead and throw a little cash her way. If you've got some to spare, I will put a link up on the biters page. Good. Cause I can't find it. <laughs> yeah. So she reached out to Thomas and asked him to, to kind of spread the word. So I said that I would definitely mention it on the podcast. Yes, definitely. Um, so not so nice news about the walking dead. Do you remember that stunt man who was killed? Yes, and I did see the court decision. Yeah, so John Bernecker, Bernecker, I'm not sure if I'm saying his name right. He was killed during the filming of season eight. He actually fell, sounds like he fell out of a balcony and he was supposed to land on crash pads and actually hit concrete and he ended mm -hmm. up dying of his head injuries. Mm hmm. His mom is suing AMC Stalwart Films, which is the production company, and actually even like a producer, and Austin Emilio was the only actor in the set with him, and she's actually suing Austin Emilio, Emilio as well, Aww. which kind of bums me out. Yeah. Um, and she is alleging that AMC enforced, quote, cheap and unsafe filming and production patterns. Uh, and the judge who is hearing the case did rule that they could go to trial, that they would go forward with it. I also thought that I read somewhere where they, um, there was a, an original ruling or, or they, they had appealed a ruling about uh, how um, AMC is basically like, we're not responsible for what somebody else did. You know, I didn't read that in particular, I did look at another link that said that AMC got fined. Actually, it wasn't AMC. It was Stalwart Films, the production company, got fined by OSHA, the Occupational Health and Safety right. gover Government Body. Um, and they got fined a little over $12,000, which was the maximum, maximum fine for unsafe filming situations. Hmm. That's rough. Yeah, so, you know, that makes me really sad. I mean, the allegation is that that AMC was really pushing the production to cut corners and cut safety measures, and I hope that's not the, the case. I hope that's not true. Right. You know, I'm you not... You wouldn't think. They have such a huge budget. Well, you know, and the other thing that I want to say is I'm not this kid's mom, and it's certainly not my place to second-guess her grief, but I'm kind of yeah. wondering how Austin Emilio is responsible in all of this. Yeah, I I wonder if he was doing the stunt double for him and he was just oh, the guy that was or maybe he was in the scene with him and it was Austin Emilio who was pushing him out of a second story window or a balcony or whatever it was. 
Yeah, I don't know. You know, grief makes people do funny things. It does. And and maybe she's right. You know, maybe maybe there is some responsibility on the part of all the people she's naming. I I hope it turns out well for her Everyone. and and for the the companies absolutely. Yeah. So super sad. Um, another really sad thing, and I didn't realize this, but Angel Theory, the whole storyline about Kelly losing her hearing mm-hmm. is actually true. You know, I thought that we kind of went through this where no, this is actually we... this is actually new. I I happened to to find this article today, and you and I haven't talked about this before, but over the last few months. It sounds like Angel Theory's hearing loss has been gradually getting worse. Hmm. Um, she didn't have any hearing in the left ear. She has started losing hearing significantly in her right ear. And it sounds like her audiologist is saying that they think it will probably get to a point where it won't make a difference whether or not she's wearing hearing aids. Yeah. So they decided that rather than kind of trying to just brush it off, that they were going to make it a part of the storyline. Yeah. Yeah. And what's super cool is the the line that Connie says to her about b- it's being not a disability, being it's a, a superpower. superpower. Yeah. Um Angel Theory's mom actually said that to her. Oh. And so she related that story to Angela Kang and Angela Kang wrote it into the episode. Right. And of course, um if you watched Fear, or I'm sorry, if you watched Talking Dead, God, I've got fear on the brain. Um you know that uh, Lauren Ridloff was cast in um, The Eternals as the very first deaf superhero. Right. So, yeah, so there was kind of a nice little link to that. Right. But yeah, I I was really sad to, but but interested to read that that the storyline with Kelly is actually from Angel Theory's life. I can't remember what, because she's been hard of hearing since birth, I believe. No, it sounds um, like it actually happened as a result of an auto accident. Okay. Connie, uh, Lauren Ridloff. Has Lauren been Ridloff has been deaf, deaf, deaf since, since birth. birth. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Um, let's see. The only other things I really have to say is that Gimple talked to Deadline.com and gave a fairly extensive interview where he talked about the third series, kind of the the breadth of the whole Walking Dead universe, and then he talked about the impact that the end of the comic book series has on the Walking Dead universe as a whole. Hmm. So if people are interested in that, um, that is on Deadline.com. I did look at the Forbes reviews for this episode. So Eric Kane said that it is a solid season premiere, although, quote, nothing really to write home about. I have to say I disagreed with him. Yeah, I definitely disagree with him on that. And I'm just wondering if he's got, like, Sadiq's kind of post-traumatic stress about the last season of Fear the Walking Dead. Like, we all... Yeah. Yeah, so hopefully he'll warm to the... uh, the season more as we go on i just again thought this was a really great premiere so i don't totally agree agree with him neither um paul tassie and i do agree so he said that the premiere has a surprising most improved character which he awards to aaron yes and i will talk a little bit more about that good so that's pretty much it for whisperer's corner not busy but definitely deep right um the only other thing that I would have to add to it is Screen Rant has a article about how the new Walking Dead show, the the third show that's yet to be titled, apparently, still. Right. That's weird because they have a trailer out about it. Um, how it connects to Fear the Walking Dead and Rick Grimes. Oh, we talked a little bit about that, how it's part of the, the three communities that make up the, yeah, the communities that are the the three interlocking circles. Yeah, we talked about uh, that last week. CRM. Yeah. Yep. Um. Anything else? I don't have anything. We should uh, 
go probably right into our goods because this episode was so good. Well, why don't you go ahead? Because while you are starting out, I am going to put up the nice trick movie.com on biters. Awesome. Uh, so my good was the whole Spartan battle uh, tactics. I loved the shields. Um, I think we've been saying this all along. Why don't they carry shields? Like, and they were all they were was like what one third fifty five gallon drums and uh, spikes, and they cut out a little eye hole. It's and their formation and their uh, uh, Aaron with the spear. Like it's it's just amazing. Like it's finally what people should be in the zombie apocalypse. And this is this is what we've been saying all along. You know uh, that basically long pointy weapons and. Um, now they're actually practicing, practicing, practicing. And, of course, they're not just practicing because they have to fear the dead, but they have to fight the whisperers. So I think this was just a small snippet of what we are going to see in the future. And it was just well shot, well written, well done. I I loved it. I agree. I thought it was a great great opener mm-hmm. but it wasn't the opener opener it was still the opener i mean they opened yeah. with the satellite but it was still part of the opener right like did you have the same thing that chris hardwick did where you're like what show am i watching i totally did i was like what the oh okay right and so i had this whole moment of so long and thanks for all the fish from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Oh, that's funny. I actually, when I went to see it in the theater, I have I had never read the book or anything. Um, I didn't know that 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 was the beginning of it, and so like I I came in after like all the trailers and everything. I was a little late for the movie, which I hate. But so there's all these dolphins singing so long and thanks for all the fish, and I'm looking around. I'm like. Am I in the wrong movie? <laughs> so I kind of had that feeling with starting out in space. Mm -hmm. But what was your good? Well, my good, like Paul Tassie, was Aaron. So I really like the way Ross Marquand is playing him this season. And I really, excuse me, liked the way that Aaron has changed so much. I feel like he's a totally different person. I do too. And I, I thought that the reference to Eric, Jesus, and the Whisperers was really, really good. Right. And I'm surprised. Well, I'm kind of surprised that he made it a reference to Eric and Jesus and not Rick. Well, but, you know, he and Eric were lovers. And I think that right. he and Jesus were interested. So I, I kind of tied them together in my head for that reason. Right. Right. Yeah, I I definitely agree about his character, and uh, that guy can throw a spear like nobody else. Too. <laughs> I don't know. Alden is pretty good at throwing a spear. <laughs> <laughs> he was That's the first true. one who really threw it and really hit a walker head on, and I was like, holy cow, <laughs> he's got a heck of an arm. <laughs> oh. All right, so we both agree that there wasn't much bad in this episode, so what did you say in terms of your bad? Okay, so the whole Eugene and Rosita montage, uh, I there's just something really, really off that I don't like. And not that Eugene has ever been a font of joy. I mean, he has great one-liners and he's, you know, funny to be around and everything. But he, he seemed really unhappy and, like... I, I know Rosita's getting back into fighting shape, but I have no idea why she's all of a sudden dressing like a goth. She's like Alexandria's one goth. That's my answer to you. <laughs> I don't know 
something felt off about that scene and I didn't I, I didn't need it. I didn't really like it. And I kind of think it's weird that Eugene's going through this whole I have to study the baby thing. Yeah, I just so, I wasn't into it. I actually loved it. Oh, my goodness. I felt like they totally caught us up on everything that was happening, happening with the quadrangle in Ugh. a very short period of time. When Kirk and Jeff did this podcast way back, they always used to talk about, show us, don't tell us. Yeah. And I felt like with that montage, they were really showing us. I guess. I loved it. Plus, that song, it's called I'm Thankful. I'm So Thankful. It's by a guy named Eugene Blackwell in a band called The New Breed. I totally thought it was like, you know, 70s funk. Mm -hmm. The album was produced in 2007. Huh. It is phenomenal. The album, I listened to it today, it's called We Can't Take Life for Granted. That's a cool name for an album. So I'm going to totally tell you, I'm so thankful. Number one song of the week for me. (laughs) You and your interest in the music in the show. I... One of the things I've always loved about The Walking Dead is that they have always tapped into really interesting music. They have. They have, definitely. So uh, I actually need to post this song to the Biters page, too, because I loved it. It was a great song. It totally fit my mood today. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I had a hard time finding a bad so that was my really nitpicky bad, except for one other thing, which, which we'll get into in Rotting Potpourri. Which, by the way, Rosita really did look like a badass. She did, but what, like I said, what is with this goth look all of a sudden? Maybe it's just a lot easier when you're Supermom and you're becoming Selena. <laughs> <laughs> she's actually t- she's actually training for that role and she's just incorporating it into her time left on The Walking Dead. <laughs> Well, you know, I did like um, on The Talking Dead where she talked about how she's always been a soldier. And so seeing her in this where she's uh, doing the punching bag and training and everything like I that's what I would expect out of Rosita is to get back into fighting shape as soon as possible. So and I I guess Eugene is a good babysitter. I mean, he's not really hurting the baby. (laughs) By measuring its growth, but whatever. You know, remember what I said last week about being really annoyed by Ginny because she's like Eugene times 10? I was listening to him talk again, and I was like, I love that. (laughs) He's so funny. He pulls it off well. I don't know if it's the, the deep voice or, like... Just his whole mannerism. Like, don't get me wrong. I, I love Eugene. It just, there was something really off this episode with him. He just he just exuded this, like, unhappiness. And I don't know if it's the That's love quadrangle so or what. funny because I didn't read that at all. Maybe I misread it. Hmm. Well, tell us which one of us is right. Yeah. Did you feel like Eugene <laughs> was unhappy or did you get the completely opposite feeling? <laughs> He did have a really funny line too in the end, toward the end, about the Walking Dead being the epidermis epicureans. Yes, which was very funny. Yes, and I love you, genius. Yes, that was funny yeah. too. Yep. So, what was your nitpicky little bad? Because this episode was so good. So, I had three little nitpicky bads, and I think you're going to be able to explain the first one to me. I think I just don't remember it. Okay. How does Daryl still have gas? Uh, Didn't he, like, do some kind of conversion on the engine? uh, Yeah, the corn. They're making uh, ethanol gas. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because that's why they couldn't grow any... One of the reasons why they couldn't grow anything at the Savior compound is because, basically, the soil was poisoned because of all the chemicals that they had around. Okay, I figured that the, that you had an explanation for that. So, yeah. you know, meh. I think we both agree on this. Bad, The Walking Dead should never CGI deer. <laughs> Definitely. That is the... And somebody else pointed that out, and I cannot remember who, but... We we saw a return of the, the CGI deer, which um, we had in the episode that also referred back to Creepshow when... Um, right. Good point. Yeah. 
well, Michonne and Rick were in that uh, creepy carnival. Yes. With the, yeah. Although yep. this, although the CGI deer was bad, it wasn't as bad as that deer was. No, it wasn't. But they should just stay away from CGI deer altogether. And the other article that I saw about the deer was somebody was like, Carol said it could, uh, that tiny little deer could feed 200 right. people. <laughs> Only but if you turn it into a really stew. big stew. Yes. Yeah, well, that's Eugene said that season that they turn uh, the meat into stew because it feeds more people. Mm-hmm. So if you think if you get 100 pounds of usable meat off of the deer. That and was you a could, pretty small deer. But you can do heart, you can do liver, you can do stomach. I mean, most of that deer is edible. You could even uh, take the marrow out of the bones, you know, and make um, uh, a bone broth out of it. But so, I mean, yeah, you could probably feed 200 people. If you stretched it really, really thin. For a day. Like, let, right. let me be totally clear. You could, like, that's one meal for 200 people, not like all winter. No. Okay, the only other thing I had in my bad, some of the walker suits in the sunken ship kind of sucked in that you can see the zipper up the back kind of way. I did not notice. I actually... No, like you, I mean, not like you could literally see the zipper up the back, but kind of like sucked in that way. Okay, so there was one episode, I don't remember if it was last season or the season before, where we had some burning walkers, mm-hmm. where it was, it was the same thing. You could tell that they, they were, were actually the, I think those were the walkers that were burning when Madison died. Okay. Or maybe they were the ones that were the kind of singed ones when Negan went out into the world. Uh, so it you know what? It was actually, we were watching a retrospective. It was when they were trying to save Beth. There was uh, some walkers that were like set on fire or burned or melted or something. I disagree. I think it was the Madison ones. Okay. Maybe yeah. it was. That's my recollection. But yeah, I've, I, we've had an experience with uh, uh, visible suit zippers or, or Yeah. Not all of the walkers were bad. There were just a couple where I was like, uh, those effects aren't very good. I loved, I think he was one of the first ones that came out of the boat because he, like, it just, it it's what you would expect, you know, a walker that was subjected to, like, beach for a really long time. Kind of gelatinous and waterlogged yeah. and, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I, I really liked the um driftwood walker Mm -hmm. because when i you originally saw him it almost looked like he had these like big spider legs coming out of the back of him and after that was like the first thing you saw after the um the shot in space and i was just like what is going on for a minute i was like is it the cosmonaut walker yeah (laughs) so crazy all right, so what was your ugly? Uh, it was obviously a good ugly. <laughs> um, kind of. It, it was a, I kind of don't get it ugly. So it seemed to me like Carol wanted to be seen by Alpha because she saw Alpha before Alpha saw her, and she just stood there and glared at her until Alpha noticed her. What's up with that? Like, wouldn't you duck down and... and why do you want to cause a war? Right? So Am I wrong? I was totally not convinced that it wasn't, that Alpha wasn't a hallucination of Carol's. Totally not convinced. I, I realized that, in fact, she and Alpha did lock eyes. But for a little bit there, I thought that it was, yeah, not kind real. Of, okay, kind of like uh, she was remembering it or something. Yeah, that was just, it was, I was like, why? Why would you want to be seen and cause a war? Like, at this point so far, the the we don't n- totally know if uh, the whispers are in the area. And if even if they are, they probably don't know we're in the area. And even if they did, you kind of have a great explanation of we were putting out the forest fire before it burned everything down. Like... 
I just, why does Carol want this war? Well, because it's revenge for Henry. Yeah, I know. But I just, you're going to get a lot of people killed for your own agenda. Mm, I don't know that that matters so much to Carol. She yeah. definitely seems like, even though being out at sea was good for her, she seems like there's still some pretty major depression going on. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the whole part of her that's like, let's just go. Let's just get on the back of your bike and go. Yeah, that was really surprising. I mean, I just, I can't imagine those two just like running away together. Like it makes more sense for her to be on the boats all the time. Eric Kane thought it was a really good idea and like it would be an interesting plot twist, but he said The Walking Dead will never take that kind of chance with those two characters. Oh, heck no. <laughs> Maybe uh, Austin and Emilio will come back to the pr pr Walking Dead Prime and those two can go off together on an ethanol motorcycle. We can always hope for his sake that that happens. Right? <laughs> So right. what was your ugly? So my ugly was obviously a good ugly, and it was actually your good. So it was the <laughs> opener. Yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit more about it because it was really tense. It was really gripping. It had that kind of tension that we wanted for the whole 16 episodes of Fear and never got. <laughs> I loved the whole shield wall and military phalanx. That was so cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was like gladiator yes ross marquand was channeling russell crowe <laughs> it was so good and the whole thing is and you kind of made this point that kind of military formation is going to be useful against both the dead and the living right i mean there is a reason why the spartans did it um mm -hmm. the only thing that probably could help them is to make the bottom of their shields more pointed so that they could plant them down into oh, the yeah, like soil. Put, put spikes on the bottom so it plants. Yeah, yeah. well, I even make it a like a pointy. Oh yeah, uh, I know what you're triangle. talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the only like addition that I would make to their uh, their military drill. So the other thing that was part of my good and part of the open was I really loved the cinematography, especially like Michonne slicing through the heads of the walkers. I wrote that. I, yeah. It's Michonne slicing top of walkers' heads. I wrote that down. I it just... was beautifully <sighs> shot. Greg Nicotero is just a phenomenal director. He really and is. That just proves that a katana is like one of the best <laughs> weapons you can have in the zombie apocalypse because the uh, Jerry and the King weren't quite as effective as she was with their broadswords. Michonne is going to be missed. Mm -hmm. The only other thing I want to point out about the opening is that I feel like her slicing off that walker's face was totally foreshadowing the return of yes. the whispers. I thought so too. Absolutely. Yep. Because um, it's it was almost the same thing as when uh, Judith and RJ have the one that came out of the bucket. Yes. Like, yeah. Yep. I agree. So now we're sounding into soundly soundly. Good lord. Into riding potpourri. Um, and the thing that I will say is I really liked the satellite crashing for a couple of different reasons. It kind of was that continuous thread throughout the story that kept pulling all of the storylines back together. Yeah, you know, normally I don't like it when they jump around in time, but because you had this one pointed thing that could draw you back to where everyone was, it was very well done. Well, and the other thing was, it really reminded us that we are part of this greater world. Mm -hmm. That there's other stuff and bigger stuff outside of the world of our survivors that's happening. And I thought that it was a really real problem. And the fire that was created by the crash was a real problem that we have not seen, seen them exploit before in this universe. Well, and so I think Angela King touched on it on Talking Dead where... 
you do have all of this space junk that's floating around above our atmosphere. And if it is not maintained, it will eventually come crashing back down to Earth. And it, call back to the Wang Chung song from the very first Walking Dead ever called Space Junk. <laughs> that's right. Yes. That's awesome. Yeah, so... um it, it's it's definitely a call out to there's there's other things going on in the world that's it's a much or much larger place than we think and I I almost wonder if that's kind of uh like there it's a much larger world and Rick Grimes is still in it with CRM and all this other stuff going on like don't forget that it's not just Alexandria Hilltop and Oceanside I think there's some legitimacy to that. Yeah. And then, of course, Eugene was very, very excited about getting his hands on the technology. And they did touch on that on The Talking Dead, where that's going to be a major thing. I'm OK with that. I am, too. I'm I'm really interested to see what he can pull out of a Russian satellite that he can use. Well, he is Eugenius. Right. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if he could piece together a plane and fly it. Well, he's not one of the 20 kids from Fear. Right? <laughs> oh, So, what was with the chapters? I actually really liked the chapters. I thought it was unnecessary. Oh, I was good with it. I just thought it kind of added to the feel of, of the episode. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I didn't mind them. It's just that uh, Sea Dogs and New Mexico, basically, like, we just, because normally the chapters, like, bookended, like, a, a piece of the story. But Sea Dogs and, and New Mexico was when um, Daryl and Carol were off doing their little side mission. And uh, it, it, there was no, it, it didn't need a break, you know, like. It was just a weird, it was a weird break. Hmm. I think we don't agree again. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, I actually really loved Judith's face when she saw the Whisperer's mask. Yeah. I thought it was another great moment for Kaylee Fleming. She really pulled that off very well. You know, and I do have to say, as much as I love Kaylee Fleming, uh, the little boy who plays RJ, and I'm not going to have his... Oh, uh, Anthony Azor is an amazing little actor. He is a cute little kid. And they picked like, a kid who really looks like he could be the offspring of Rick and Michonne. Yes, absolutely. Like, But I'm just like... There's this little boy like memorizes his lines or, you know, like he, he, he had so many lines in this episode and he just, he nailed them all and he was adorable and very engaging and he was, he was believable as RJ, you know, he wasn't just a little kid actor, you know, I, I don't know. I just, it really struck me like, um, and I really loved their little interaction about the brave man that lives inside of our hearts and makes yes. us brave too. Oh my yes. God. I, and you know, I actually wrote down exactly that line. Yep. Yeah. Gives me chills. It, yeah. Like it kind of brings a little bit of a tear to my eye because like uh, Kaylee said on the talking dead, this is uh, the, the piece that she still has of her dad, you know? Oh, so cute. Shane's baby. Ah! <laughs> I totally did, haven't thought of that in a really long time. Thanks for putting that dagger in my heart. You're welcome. Uh. So good. Um, welcome back to Sydney Park. Uh, yes. Sydney. Sydney, from, Sydney Park. Sydney from Sydney. Oceanside. Yes. Um, I'm actually surprised that she's not more of a leader in Oceanside. It, it feels like, um, Michonne and Aaron are kind of the leaders. No, they actually made a point of, of saying that Michonne and Aaron were just visiting. They were just there for training. Okay. 
Um, so, yeah, I mean, we don't have kingdom anymore. So everyone's kind of spread, got to spread out between the Alexandria Hilltop and Oceanside that's left. You know, I just realized we totally didn't talk about the title. We didn't. And, you know, it was one of the chapters. So, lines we cross. you know, I, I think it obviously has to do with crossing the boundaries set up by the whisperers. But the right. other thing, and the thing that made me think of this as I wrote this down, you always say this, and Aaron said it this time, we're the villains yes. of somebody else's story. Yes. So I think it was also really about those blurred lines between being the hero and being the villain. Are we the good guys? Mm-hmm. Yep. And I really liked that Aaron and Michonne were kind of in opposition. Yeah. And that she was the one who was cautioning him about being too cautious. That's very different from where she was last season. Warning him about being too cautious? Or, yeah. Not, she was, not being cautious enough. No, she was warning him to be about being too cautious. She was like, you know, don't do this whole alert thing. Don't get everybody all stirred up. Oh, I think you're okay. going to get people too freaked out. So I was thinking of their you interaction, were of the on, interaction the on the bridge. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I see another, what you mean. another uh, line that that could be crossed is um, Negan. He's kind of crossed over into an us instead of a them. Right. Is he a villain or is he a good guy? Right. And I, I don't know. Like he, he seems like a good guy, but also he's sitting back and being like, no, I, I, oh God, what did he say? Um, Using the truth to manipulate people. Right. Yeah. His whole thing was, it doesn't matter what you tell people if they're safe at the end of the day. Right. Right. I, I thought the interaction between he and Gabriel was really interesting. Yeah. That's another one. Gabriel, he just seems eternally unhappy, too. <laughs> well, you know, there are a lot of people who still don't know how he and Rosita ended up together. So maybe that's why he's eternally unhappy. <laughs> and I am one of them. You know, even Sadiq with his PTSD is uh, is a little better than uh, Father Gabriel. He's more appealing to you than Mr. Creepy Eye. Right? <laughs> oh. So weird. Uh, I'm looking over my notes. Oh, I thought it was really shocking, but um, a good lead into our upcoming backstory about Lydia and Alpha that Lydia can't read. Oh, yeah. I felt so bad for her. Oh, I, I think it was a nice little add to her character another little piece of information about her that that really illuminates who she is yeah and i mean that's you and i are on the outside going that's nothing to be ashamed of like you've you haven't been to school since you were like seven years old or something so like it's like i just felt bad for her because you know she seems so ashamed of it and so yeah I, you know, I think it's a, I think it's giving us a sign of what's to come with Lydia. I think she's still having a really hard time adapting. And I think we'll see that play out throughout the season. Well, and you know, she lost Henry too. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that was kind of her big connection to the, um, the societies is it's, you know, she had this boy that she liked. I mean, it's not like she clicked with Carol. It's not like she clicked with the King. It was Henry. And now she's, she doesn't have her mom, which is what she's known all of her life. And she, yeah, she's just got to go on without everyone. Um, so is it just me or did the King and Luke, Luke, uh, get much fitter like I feel <laughs> Luke definitely looks much fitter yeah yeah like not that like I'm I'm shaming their previous bodies or something but this is definitely this would be a thing like uh people would you know basically get into fighting condition you know and like you, there's no not a lot of um 
car- bad carbs or sugars or anything like that. So you're living off of fruits, veggies, and protein, you know? So I I just... Zombie apocalypse on- keto. <laughs> But good on them. Like, you know, that that can't be an easy thing for an actor or an actress to lose weight and maintain a weight for a role that wasn't something that was natural to them before. So. Did you notice that, by the way, Ezekiel has totally dropped the Shakespearean stuff and he's talking like a regular person? Oh, and he even told Jerry, I'm not your boss anymore. That was so sad. So that awkward moment between him and Carol was really hard and really touching, especially when it was highlighted by her, like, totally effusive greeting to Daryl. Yeah. Yeah. (sighs) I did write in my notes that the wigs are way better than they were last season. (laughs) Especially Carol's. Carol's looks really good. Oh, yeah, it it really does. I, I will give you that one. Um, she's pulling it back more. She doesn't look so witchy. Yeah. Um, so, uh, speaking of hairdos, Angel Theory, uh, Kelly must have uh, the same clippers as Al carries around because oh. her, <laughs> her, her do was high and tight. You know what's really funny? It doesn't bug me nearly as much as Al's does. No, no. I, yeah. In fact, I actually wrote, and it's funny that you say this, uh, that these actors really inhabit their characters. Like, I never question that they're actors. I never question, like, the decisions. I never question decisions about how they're shown because they just are these people to me. Whereas, right. whereas I am constantly like, oh, come on. You know, would Al really have hair that perfect in the zombie apocalypse? Would Salazar really all of a sudden become such a nice guy when he was stripping skin off of somebody in season one? <laughs> I just don't have that, that I don't know, loss of faith in the character that I, I do with fear. I'm totally, like, these characters are completely believable to me. And it's so funny that you say that because right before uh, we started podcasting, I was actually thinking... God, I'm really rusty because, like, I cannot remember anybody's real name, any of the actors' real name. It's just, it's it's Luke and Grace and uh, Rachel and Kelly and Lloyd. Like, these, they're just them. Like, I don't see, you know, Ross Marquand or or you know, um, Denai Guerrero or anything like that. It's it's Aaron and Michonne. Like, it's yeah, they are their characters. Speaking of Michonne. I want to point out, because I don't think you ever got this far in the comic books, they actually gave Carol Michonne's storyline from the comics. Michonne actually goes out to sea and fishes for a long, long, long time to break break it off with the king. Oh, interesting. Spoiler alert for a series that is now over. Um, I also thought the best friends and matching bracelets moment was really funny and sweet, but it also was another thing where they were kind of drawing us into that greater world, that bigger world, because Daryl and Carol were talking about what's out there beyond what they know. Right. Right. Um, I I love that scene too, because it, it was a genuine thing of, of how friends are like, uh, she said, did you miss me? And he's like, not really. <laughs> that is exactly something I would say to my friends, you know? Yeah, I really, for me, it really put paid to the whole shipping thing. I was, I totally was able to let that go and just see them as friends. I mean, even with her saying, let's just get on your bike and go. I didn't feel mm-hmm. like it was, it was a romantic thing. I felt like it was a best friends thing. Yeah. Exactly. And it, it's so funny. We we did a retrospective and um, that episode when they were taking, they had just taken the prison and, uh, and she he was, was flirting up, with him. Yeah. Yes. She's like, you want to screw around? And he's like, stop it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They've been that way forever and it just, it works for them. Um, uh, Donnie. <laughs> Connie yes. and Daryl. You know, in fact, one of the articles that I was reading before we came on tonight actually pointed out that 
Kelly, Angel Theory's character, like raised her eyebrows and kind of gave Connie a significant look as Daryl was coming toward them, which I, <gasps> I missed. missed it. I yeah. totally missed it too. That's funny. And you know, I'd be fine with watching this episode a third time. I Which, would do. Did you hear me saying that about the about fear at all? <laughs> uh, no, we were loath to watch it a second time, <laughs> even a first time. Sometimes, sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So definitely. there, there are definitely shades of Donnie. I think it's still possible. I think that's mm -hmm. much more possible than Carol. I do too. Um, did you notice that they added the bridge scene from Rick uh, on the bridge to the intro? You know, I noticed that there were some subtle changes in the intro. I didn't notice that. What I did notice was that um, the name, The Walking Dead, the way it was displayed in the credits, it was much brighter and it was moss covered. And I thought that was new. Uh, so when they were... There was a whole big article about uh, the previous credits before we got these animated ones, um, how the the Things title kind of degraded. Was degraded. And so when they finally started building up Alexandria, they, they when they changed the intro, they made it a new one. And now it is becoming more green because that's how the rest of the world is becoming. And, you know, the nature is retaking the earth. So, Yeah. Yeah, I thought there were some subtle changes. I, I liked it. I still liked the opening credits. Yeah, I really, really looked for them um, to see if, if there were any changes. But yeah, the bridge is the only one that I noticed. Well, now I definitely have to go back and watch it a third time. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that I really appreciated that also got us caught up quickly by showing us rather than telling us we saw little glimpses of other characters like Earl Sutton helping fight the fire. Um, we saw Laura, Lindsay Register's character. Mm -hmm. I just liked that they kind of brought all of these other characters, even for brief glimpses into it to remind us and ground us. Oh, yeah, that's where we are in the story. And that's who that person is. And they did a nice job of kind of reintroducing things. Yeah, they actually did. Um, and speaking of that... The storytelling about uh, how they find out that the whispers are probably near uh, where they. Oh, the camp. The camp. Mm -hmm. because, you know, you're just you're so used to. Oh, yeah, it's a dead body, you know, but it was obviously humans versus walkers. And there was like obviously a human that was killed. And then there was a skin and it was just, it was a really great way to demonstrate that, you know, the the walkers are definitely, or I'm sorry, the whispers definitely are back in the area. It's not just any old regular dead body hanging around. And it wasn't just our group crossing the lines. It was their, their group as well. Right. Cro crossing into our group's territory. Right. The lines we cross. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I don't think I had anything else. I just, I really loved the episode. Yes, I was super happy with this episode. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I have a lot else either. Well, we have some listener feedback, don't we? All right. We'll just rock in with some space junk while I'm pulling that up. <laughs> All right. So Nikki Campbell Keith, thank you. She said, y'all take as much time as you need. Still sending good thoughts and hugs. So, so happy that our original show is back on. Fear was a dumpster fire. Right. Um, Lori Samalian, who is an old friend of mine, said she really enjoyed Carol making eye contact with Alpha. Alpha should just cut her losses and mosey that horde somewhere our heroes don't go. I can't wait to see what Carol has in store. I'm also interested in Connie and Daryl's potential romance. I'm there for it. All right. And then Pedro Pelez. Hey, Pedro. He said the training scene was one of the best scenes in the whole series. And I, uh, I completely three. agree. Yep. Yep. Um, and then one more comment from Lori. She said, is Lori coming or is, is Maggie coming back? She made that show on CBS called Whiskey Tango. I never saw it. 
Um, yeah, it was you whiskey. And Cav- everybody else, right? It was whiskey cavalier. I agree. Yeah, it was meh. <laughs> so there is actually a really cute little clip from um, one. Of, I think the last one of the last cons, maybe a Walker Stalker, where. Uh, somebody is they're bringing somebody up on stage and chris hardwick is kind of hosting this big panel of of all of our oh it was uh, nycc yeah okay and so there's somebody in the audience dressed like negan and we talked about this last episode too we did we did and they're wearing a hockey mask and they run up on stage and they they seem like a, a really excited fan and everything and pulls off the mask and it's uh it's uh Lauren uh, Cohan. Lauren Cohan, thank you. I'm trying saying Maggie because she's Maggie. Um and it was to announce that yes, she will be back on the show this season. You know, and we got a little bit of uh a little tidbit of that where the uh the boats that ca- the boat that Carol was on uh goes and picks up letters from Maggie. And they haven't heard from Maggie in a while. Right. And I think the reason they haven't heard from Maggie in a while is because she's on her way. Exactly. And of course, in the comics, her and Dante are together. So it makes me wonder if they're going to do that or if we're completely off book at this point. I think there's a good chance they're going to do that. I do, too. And so, like we said, I really hope they improve upon his character. I am hopeful. I I don't think they can leave him being that shallow and that um, that unexplored. You know, sometimes opposites attract. Maybe uh, Maggie's seriousness and, and leadership just needs a little bit of balance. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. So do you have anything else? No, I'm just putting up a few show links on the buyers page. And if people are interested, um, put up a post for the song. I'm so thankful. And I'm putting up a, a post for the Wang Chung song right now so that people can check that out again. And uh, I think that's it for this week. We've got an alpha backstory. It'll be right. interesting. We're going to see how she and Beta meet. Mm-hmm. Be interesting to see if they introduce Gamma, the new Whisperer, in that, or if they wait. Yeah, I don't know if it'll just be a completely uh, one-off show where it's just the backstory, or if they'll show some current time. Yeah, not sure. Looking forward to it, though. If it was as good as the opener was, I think we're off to a good start. I do, too. I am so glad the series is back. Yes. I love fall. So bulky, bulky sweaters, hot cider with rum, and the uh, Walking Dead Prime. So we need to catch up on Preacher. We do. And I want you to kind of put in your little head, maybe we should think about going to Chicago in April. Yeah, I did see that. Yeah. It's not, it's not a Walker Stalker though, is it? It is a a Walker Stalker. No, it's a Walker Stalker. Okay. Okay. I couldn't find any of the actors. You'll have to send me a link. I don't think Uh, they have announced yet. Okay. I... I think they just have the date. I don't don't think they've done a bunch of announcement yet. Announcements yet. Um, now so. I'm clicking there. So it is going to be April 18th and 19th next year. You're right. I'm sorry. It is a fan fest. Okay. Um, but it, I mean, it's a Walker Stalker property that it's just right. more encompassing. Right. And uh, maybe we could uh, visit Rob. And Diana and Steve. Oh, that's right. Mm-hmm. And it looks like... Um, oh, my God. I'm so embarrassed. I don't remember his name. The dude who plays the brother in Game of Thrones. Tyrion's brother. Tyrion's brother. 
Oh, yeah. Uh, Jamie Lannister. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's yeah, going to yeah. be there. Yep. I did see that. Um, Nikolai Kostrowaldo. I'm sure I am totally slaughtering his name. <laughs> I can't even begin to think how I'm probably slaughtering his name. Uh, that's why I was like, I don't think it's actually a Walker Stalker is because there's a couple of Game of Thrones characters that mm-hmm. are going to have panels there. So I am a super Game of Thrones fan. As is Diana. That might get me to go. All right. I want you to seriously think about it. As if I needed another reason to go. There are straight flights from Anchorage to Chicago. Anchorage? Yeah. I so live in you'd Juneau. Ha- I know. You'd have to fly up here first and then we could fly together. Isn't that crazy? I have to take a two-hour plane ride north so that I can get to the lower 48. Or you could take a three-hour plane ride south and fly direct from Seattle. That's true. <laughs> You just want me to have a, a, a what, six-hour plane ride with you? There you go. I don't want to yep. be alone. <laughs> if somebody's going to be belching and farting next to me, I want it to be my sister. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I need to be TSA pre-check. <laughs> I say I don't travel, and I've taken, like, six trips in the last two years. And trust me, people... It is super expensive to get out of Juno because we usually have one airline who has a monopoly. Right. Like you've got another airline there for three months in the summer, right? Yep. Delta only flies in in the summer months because um, what I've heard is they don't have the equipment and or the pilots, experienced pilots that can handle our uh, wintertime weather. Oh, they're just BSing. They just don't want to do it because they can't afford to do it in the winter and not take a loss. Right. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it's like, I'm it's not, I'm not even kidding. It's like $900 a ticket to get out of here. So I was looking today and to get from Anchorage to Chicago, if we do it cheaply, it's like two to 300 bucks a, a, a trip one way. <laughs> See, and I wasn't even looking at flights. I was looking at the uh, VIP packages, the silver, gold, and platinum. The platinum package VIP tickets are $900. For Walker Stalker? For the Fan Fest in Chicago. Yeah, so we're not going to be getting platinum tickets, I'll tell you that much. No, no, no. I don't need uh, a con concierge. Thank you. Yeah. No. But... I could totally go for maybe a silver package. I think that was 140 bucks a person. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I could definitely do that. Because it, like, it guarantees you a lot of um, photo ops and things like that, even if the photo ops are already sold out. So, yeah. I just thought it'd be fun <sighs> to go somewhere together that we get a chance to meet up with other podcasters and be geeks for a weekend. Right? Yeah. Maybe I should crowdsource it. <laughs> <laughs> Us and Emma Bell. <laughs> right? Right? So, yeah, All right. Go, go support her movie. Yeah. I posted I... that link, too. Excellent. So, we only have a couple of days until the, uh, the next episode, and so... Uh, you know, and life is settling down enough that I might actually be able to podcast on time this week. Maybe. I don't have any job interviews. I don't have any classes. <laughs> well, Monday is a federal holiday and Friday is a state holiday. Not that I get the federal holiday off. I get the state holiday. It's like Alaska Day. Well, we could totally podcast. I, the only thing I have going on is some physical therapy, although I am walking much better. It's almost normal. And um, Juliet's getting groomed. Because Nick is sick of the hair. <laughs> and I'm getting a mani-pedi on Monday. Good for you. <laughs> oh, we'll figure it out. We will definitely come to you before Saturday, which is when I'm going to get this posted. I'm, I'm not posting it tonight. I'm posting it tomorrow. Good. I, it's so weird that it, like, it does not feel like Friday night because we're podcasting. Right. I don't have to get up in the morning. Yeah, I do because I have an appointment, but it's one that I want. So it's all good. <laughs> 
No, I don't have I don't have anything going till 7 p.m. tomorrow, which is Oktoberfest, not Oktoberfest, Oktoberfest, A.K. Alaska. Ah, hey, isn't uh, Zombieland two coming out this week? It is. All right, got that yeah. to look forward to. I may have to go to a movie since I'm still technically unemployed. I wonder if I can sneak my jumbo sized beer stein from Oktoberfest into the theater. <laughs> <laughs> all right girl we should probably wrap this up i think so so until next week just remember take it one, one day, dead day, day at, at a time. time have a good week everybody bye everybody bye